ok? I hope you can see our candle this morning. Uh, do we need to zoom it in closer or, or is it good? I think it's good. Let's just uh, start. Um, welcome to Community Church of Boston. If I stood out in the rain night, my only light a candle a million miles away, would you lay down your fire as I raised mine? Would you not kill again? And oh, when you're near me, Oh, my love, oh, my joy, there's nothing ever to weary me, oh, my darling one. I had to start with that song from Cindy Callett, who I was with last weekend up in Camden, Maine. Uh, love that song. And it's about lighting a candle for unity and for strength and for a still small voice that we have in the midst of, of such darkness or such uh, oppression. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dean, you could be a little louder. Could be a little louder. And would that be get closer or? Um, closer, yeah. Don't want to distort. Um, welcome to Community Church. We have a really vibrant auditorium going on here. And I want to give you a little tour of, of lots of different things we're doing. But mostly, I want to start out with, with our invited guests from across the continent, which are Pat and Sandy from Emma's Revolution. They're uh, repeat offenders to our uh, humble platform. And we love it every time they're with us. And if they're here physically present, we drop everything to try and host them if we get a chance. Pat and Sandy, welcome. And good morning, early morning out there. <laughs> good early morning to you all. We're glad to be back. We are we are happy to be repeat offenders here with you all where <laughs> where your services start with song and justice. That's that's what we do. I'm Sandy O. And I'm Pat Humphrey. It's great to be with you all this morning. We have kind of our version of a, a seasonal song for you um, about, uh, you might have heard just what Dean just said. He said, you know, in these times of darkness, and then he said, no, in these times of oppression. And this song is really both about the light and the dark, which is so central to this seasonal time, and also about taking, uh, decolonizing our language. <laughs> So you'll hear all the ways in which darkness, we want to revere the darkness and honor the darkness. And you can sing with us in the first verse. When Pat sings a line, we'll sing back the words in the light. In the second verse, we'll sing back the words in the dark. And in the third verse, we'll sing, we begin. We've come in the light to this place in the light with our hearts in the light open wide we are here in the light giving voice in the light to the truth in the light we divide let us sing for today let us learn born in the dark we are fed in the dark we connect in the dark through the veil we are held in the dark we are healed in the dark mysteries in the dark we reveal let us sing for today let us learn better ways, showing love in the dark, giving hope in the dark we create, in the dark better days. Tonight 
time is now. We begin where we are. We begin, we have all. We begin that we need to renew. We begin to release. We begin to rebuild. We begin to believe. Let us sing for today. Such an inspiration. Emma's Revolution, Pat Humphreys and Sandy O. It's just uh, always such a refreshing thing to hear this duo of long standing in our movement. Well, um, I don't want to take too much time because we have an amazing program that's coming to us from three different cor corners of, of a continent. But I want to start by talking about next Sunday's program, which will come to us from um, several different continents. And that is, uh, we're going out of this year, 2022, with a bang. We give out an annual award. It's called the Sacco and Vanzetti Award. Some of us, um, some of you might not know that this church's history is deeply entwined with Sacco and Vanzetti, the uh, founders, founding mothers of the church. One was named Mrs. Winslow, Mrs. Gertrude Winslow, and one was named Mrs. Elizabeth Glendower Evans, uh, became friends with Vanzetti and visited him many times in, in prison and tutored him in English. And... Um, one of the, the very first entry in our archives uh, from 1921, uh, we were founded in 1920, but 21 is when the records started to be kept, was a Sacco Vanzetti fundraising supper at a, at a big um, function room that no longer exists, but it was right here in Copley Square. And um, in 1927, when they were executed, um, Mrs. Winslow was in Italy visiting Vanzetti's family when word came down. Uh, but um, we gave out this the Sacco and Vanzetti uh, Memorial Award, and this year is a very special one. It goes to, we call it, Vic uh, Survivors of the USA's War on Terror. And that is the Holy Land Foundation, five, um, and uh, three of them are still in prison. And it also goes to Sami al -Aryan. These were um, all Palestinian um, men who were caught up in the hysteria in the aftermath of September 11th and uh, indicted and tried and convicted on trumped up charges uh, in need of, of a, uh, a scapegoat. Basically, these were, you remember John Ashcroft? <laughs> uh, and uh, these, these indictments announced uh, very publicly, like on Jay Leno or on, on uh, uh, you know, a big, a big TV announcement that we're making progress. The Holy Land Foundation Five were five successful Palestinian businessmen who started a foundation in the 90s. It became quickly the largest Muslim foundation uh, charity in the United States and did enormous work 
in support of Palestinian children, in-kind donations to children in Gaza and the West Bank, and also a lot of local charity as well. Then came 9-11 and the, the foundation was shut down and, and then there was a trial and they were convicted and sent to long prison terms. That was 16 years ago. Three of them are still in prison. We will be, uh, with us will be uh, the daughters of Shukri Abu Bakr. Her name is Nida Abu Bakr. Also present with us will be Miko Peled, who, um, if you don't know about him and his work and his books, he's just a force to be contended with. The Israeli son of one of the generals of, of the 1967 um, conflict uh, and um, has become an incredible critic and thorn in the side of the state of Israel, especially it's what it is right now in this, in this horrible moment. Miko Pilled will be with us, also present with us, will be one of the Holy Land Foundation Five who has been released on parole. His name is Abdul Rahman Oday. And those three will be with us, and we are expecting quite a turnout. Um, we're going to post the uh, the link to uh, reserve your place here. It's at noon on Sunday, and we are just so excited about this, and especially because these cases are so similar to Saquon Vanzetti, immigrants scapegoated in the aftermath of, uh, in, in, in the midst of, of national hysteria and trumped up charges and, and horrible consequences for these men and their families, especially I've gotten to, to have contact with just these beautiful families. Uh, and we're just so looking forward to getting to know them better and learning more about their situation. Sami al -Aryan, was a professor in Florida. What is it, Florida State University? I'm trying to remember which university it was, but same thing. Palestinian was, um, uh, was involved in charitable work in Palestine, got indicted, tried, six month trial. There's an amazing uh, documentary that's called The USA versus Sami Al Arian. Check it out. Uh, uh, it's it's a filmmaker who follows these families or this this family, uh, um, uh, Sami's wife and children, uh, through this incredible trial. Just uh, six months worth of worth of trial that this family went through, and then that brings up the fact that Lena Alarian will be with us as well. Lena is Sami's daughter, lives right here in in Boston, and. Um, in Boston area, in Easton, actually south of Boston, and is a fierce defender of, uh, of her father and of all political prisoners in this country. Uh, the, uh, the, the organization she works for is called Coalition for Civil Freedoms, and we'll get to know that organization as well, because um, on this list behind me of Saquon Vanzetti Award winners, are Leonard Peltier, Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, the first one we ever gave was to William Kunstler, that fierce defender of Black Panthers and of um, underrepresented uh, vulnerable people in the city of New York. Um, Lynn Stewart, I don't know if you know that name, but uh, she was she passed away. She was an attorney who uh, who represented the first Imam. Uh, who was uh, was indicted and tried for being implicated somehow in the first Trade Center bombing, and um, I won't go into her uh, her situation, but we honored her as well with our um, she was uh, with our award. She spent uh, a significant time in prison before she was 
released as soon before she passed away. We're in touch with her husband, who is named Ralph Pointer. So that's about next Sunday. And I hope you will join us, if not physically, then virtually. It's uh, going to be a marvelous way to take out uh, the year 2022. Um, and we're just so looking forward to that event. I was, want to also mention last night we had a magnificent event that is hopefully a template for what this auditorium will be in, in the months to come in the hopefully aftermath of, of, of the COVID silence in this auditorium, which is an, really an organizing place. We had an event that Jill Stein and Mass Peace Action brought together. It, it represented were uh, several different uh, activist grassroots organizations um, talking about their, their causes and talking about their activism and their, and their tactics and methods. It was a really marvelous uh, gathering right here in this room. We also happen to have an art display uh, on the walls. The um, let me see what happened. Yes, see if I can see if I can do this. Uh, I'm using my phone. I don't want to join audio to show you some of Diane Esmond's painting. Diane Esmond, uh, French painter, who who was born in uh, around 19. 10, died in around 1981. I don't know, I don't have her years exactly, but it's beautiful paintings. Um, left France during World War II. A lot of the paintings that we have on the wall were confiscated by the Nazis and then reclaimed and re repatriated to their family. Her son is named Victor Wallace and he's deeply involved in our, in our congregation. And uh, he and his wife Inez have uh, put up this display, along with our wonderful uh, publications manager, Crystal Rollins Jackson. And um, these paintings are for sale, all proceeds to benefit Community Church of Boston's massive building construction projects that we are um, taking on full force in the upcoming years. So I'm going to walk around and show you some paintings, okay? Here goes. So I ended on, on a couple of images that aren't from Diane Esmond. They're from our own Crystal Rollins Jackson, who's a marvelous graphic designer. And the very last thing you saw was a painting by Ralph Fazanella, who um, uh, documented very beautifully in his um, unschooled painting style the, the, the strikes of, of Lawrence and Lowell. Uh, we we inherited that Ralph Fazanella print from the, the late Bob Dottilio, and I was going to go frame it and found out it would cost $500, and I said, ah! um, but it will eventually be given the, 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 the proper um, uh, framing and, and elegance that it deserves. I um, want to tell you about a couple other things going on. We have every Wednesday at noon, open house here at the church. We serve pupusas, which come from Chelsea, thanks to Luis Guzman, our cook and janitor. And um, this, uh, this Wednesday, we'll be writing letters and cards to our members behind bars. 
Uh, there are presently seven of them. I have seven letters that have our new newsletter. And, and I also will have a small money order um, and, and cards that we're going to be writing to them this Wednesday. So join us this Wednesday and every Wednesday for our open house at noon. Um, uh, we'll have we'll have a uh, a feast for you. Um, following next Sunday, we're going to have a holiday bazaar, and uh, we've gotten a big shipment of Palestinian products from um, the Tree of Life. No, what what is her? Linda Cohen, I'm not remembering her or the name of her store, but has a store on Martha's Vineyard that sells all Palestinian products. Here's some kafias, and here's a little book with its Palestinian things that I grabbed out of the box at the last minute. We will also have uh, after, after the Palestine Holy Land Foundation event, we will have as well um, crafts and coffee from El Salvador, which will be um, what I bring to this uh, holiday bazaar. It will be during our office hours, which are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 10 to 5 approximately. And um, you can come and you can pick out uh, a few books. We have a mountain of books and we have to get rid of a lot of them because they would consume our entire two floors uh, if we didn't start making a plan to get rid of uh, a lot of books. So come by and maybe you can find a gift for somebody in the form of, of a book. We have mountains of poetry, mountains of books about film, theater. And here's my favorite, or maybe my least favorite um, books about the occult, astrology, witchcraft, um, uh, satany, de, de, um, pagan, pagany, that's what it is. Uh, there's a whole like yard of, of books uh, about that. Um, and tarot is in there as well, uh, which is it's interesting. We, we have a new tenant in, in this building. They're called the History Project. We're just so excited to have them. The History Project documents, archives, and preserves the uh, um, Boston's LGBT history. And they are on our fourth floor. And one of the principals came by and I had this very old book, uh, like a, a guide to tarot. And she's way into it and uh, how tarot um, interfaces with LGBT uh, culture fascinating um, things to learn about. I've been going on too long. I would like to proceed to shut up and bring back uh, Emma's revolution for what we call the musical message uh, to uh, beautifully set us up for our, our talk today, which comes from Calla Walsh, who joins us from Canada. Emma's revolution, so glad to have you. So glad to be with you all. Well, I know that these have been uh, challenging times these last few years, and it's uh, it's taken us, you know, that um, inner search for that uh, resilience, that uh, that inner strength that that keeps us going, that has kept a lot of us uh, going through this time. So uh, sometimes I, uh, I need to be reminded that it's there so I can draw upon it. When I wake up in the morning and I open my eyes, I remember to be grateful for the bright blue skies. And I wonder what I'm here for. Give me meaning, I pray, for the breath in this body I've been given today. And I listen to the wind as she whispers low, I am always here, you are not alone. All from a tell you power, you are blood and bone. Water and 
the gale will wash away stone Unsteady on my feet as I rise from my bed I need a sound of quiet of a noise in my head Memories of heartache unresolved from the past I'm ready to release them from my spirit at last And I listen to the wind as she whispers low I am always here, you are not alone Hold firm me to your power Water and a gale will wash away stone. May my heart be strengthened, my purpose be clear. May I always remember the path that led here. Children of ancients, seeds of the soul. Born of resistance, beauty and toil And I listen to the wind as she whispers low I am always here, you are not alone Hold firmly to your power, you are blood and bone Water and a gift Wash away stone. Hold firm to your power. You are blood and bone. Water and a gale will wash away stone. Water and a gale will wash away stone. Water and a gale will wash away. So we're going to be singing to you about the elements this morning. It ends up uh, water, <laughs> earth, air, and this song about fire, um, because this has been such a time of witnessing that young activists are really taking the lead and that we need to follow those of us who are of our age, uh, need to follow. We need to get on board. We need to support them. This is a song uh, that we wrote for one of the last major demonstrations we did before the pandemic. We were outside the Capitol at one of the fire drill Fridays that Jane Fonda was calling. And they've actually um, resumed. They're, they started again in DC. So you can go down and show your support uh, especially, uh, you know, older activists who have not been as engaged in the climate actions happening. And we know that our speaker today, Kella Walsh, has taken action in so many issues, including climate change. And this song we wrote to sing there at the demonstration has a part for you to sing. You can sing the words, put out the fire with us. And of course, the question of which fires we're putting out has expanded so much. So not just climate change, not just, right? How can we even say that not just climate change, a major, major thing we need to address, but also of course, racism, sexism, homophobia, and of course, you know, poverty and the things that have made our lives uh, so challenging and really make us question, what are we doing on this earth? How are we living together? So we love being with activist groups like you all to start our day out here on the West Coast where wildfires are just in the next county from us uh, when it's wildfire season. And of course that season has been all uprooted by climate change. So in this song, Sing With Us, Put Out the Fire, and we quote the words of Greta Thunberg who said, I need you to act like your house is on fire because it is. Mm. Put out the fire, put out the fire, put out the fire, our 
house is on fire. Put out the fire. Put out the fire. Put out the fire. Our house is on fire. We love you. We hear you. We commit to change our ways. Not later, but sooner. Right now, for our future. The youth can't wait. Put out the fire. Women can't wait. Put out the fire. The climate can't wait. Put out the fire. Our house is on fire. For our children. Put out the fire. And their children. Put out the fire. And their children. Put out the fire. Our house is on fire. For songbirds. For clean air. For the oceans and the bays. Not later, but sooner. Right now. Melting glaciers, put out the fire. Rising seas, put out the fire. Bleaching color, put out the fire. Our house is on fire. Shrinking shorelines, put out the fire. Sinking islands, put out the fire. Growing dry land, put out the fire. Our house is on fire. Let bees live and let trees grow. Let the snow fall. Sooner, right now, for the future, right now, for the future, right now. We are here to put out the fire. This is how we put out the fire. Time is now. We put out the fire. Our house is on fire. Thanks so much. Emma's revolution. I'm tingling all over. <laughs> Beautiful, powerful songs from Sandy and Pat. Um, I'm going to quote Greta Thunberg as well and say that I'm, she, 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 she said about the COP17, um, it's just more blah, blah, blah. What a great quote, and I'm going to try to be very brief to that, um, to that purpose. Less blah, 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 and more action, and more on the streets, and more chance to hear from young folks like Calla Walsh. Calla came to us via Mass Peace Action, where at age 17, she was not only active but and, and, and an intern, but soon became a board member. Um, and soon after that, Amar brought several of the interns over to for a little tour of the church, which we do on Wednesdays after the uh, the open house. Uh, and we get to go up to the third floor where we have uh, this uh, Sacco and Vanzetti room that has all the all the primary source materials from the case that Bob Dottilio collected during out during his lifetime that we have inherited and that's being beautifully um, uh, curated by the wonderful Jerry Kaplan. Then then we went to the fifth floor, which uh, which has some of community churches uh, records. In fact, all of them up there and sort of in disorder, but laid out and we're trying to make order. And you can find letters between our minister and Martin Luther King, and they go back and forth about dates that he's going to speak. And he goes back and forth saying, Let, let's say, uh, sorry, I can't be here on that date. Uh, but I certainly do appreciate community church and, and the, the times that I attended while I was a graduate student at Boston University. And, you know, just a mess of letters from all these different speakers that back in the day, when, uh, when this church, uh, had a huge audience. Symphony Hall, 2,000 people might come to hear W.B. Du Bois or uh, the likes of uh, Thurgood Marshall 
Um, later, it was in uh, Morse Auditorium, Rosa Parks, um, uh, Cesar Chavez. Uh, it's just an incredible history. It's all there on that fifth floor. Anyway, we did the tour. And um, soon after that, I attended an event that Kala had organized that was um, a pro-Palestine musical uh, fundraising benefit on, uh, on, on the lawn of the Elliott School in Jamaica Plain. And it was a huge success. And, uh, and I was saying to myself, this is quite amazing young activist. And, and then I was able to read some of her work uh, that you can find in, on the website Multipolarista of uh, uh, Ben Norton uh, is, uh, is publishing some things by Kala and other places like Mass Peace Action Newsletter. And I said to myself, this is uh, an amazing young person, uh, fully formed, eloquent author and writer and journalist. And now Kala is up at McGill in Montreal. And we are so happy that she agreed to come and tell us about her two different trips to Cuba and about activism in that regard, including I hope you will talk about a standout that uh, by unfortunate coincidence is happening at the same time next week as, as our, our uh, Sagua and Vanzetti Awards um, ceremony. But um, that happens all the time. And it's, it's a sign that, that there's a lot of activism of all kinds. Kala Walsh, thank you for joining us. We are just so happy and overjoyed to uh, receive you and host you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Dean, for the introduction. It's really nice to be with everyone virtually. I haven't been back uh, to Boston in four months, which is the longest I've ever been away from home. Um, but I'm coming home for the holidays this Wednesday and it really feels like I'm back right now um, in this community of the Community Church of Boston and surrounded by so many familiar faces of comrades and friends. Thank you, uh, Emma's Revolution, for the beautiful music. I wish there was such beautiful music and performances at every political event I do because that is how it's like in Cuba. I've never been to a meeting or conference in Cuba without dance and music performances uh, combined into the programming. And I think art is a really, really integral part of building a revolutionary culture. So it's a real honor to be speaking at the Community Church of Boston. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I think I'm one of the youngest people to speak here. Um, I wanna be very honest that I've never given a speech like this before, um, but I spent a long time writing it instead of studying for my college finals. Um, so if I fail, I'm going to blame you guys. But after um, I stopped and restarted writing it a few times, I began to really enjoy remembering all the beautiful memories I have from Cuba and also reflecting on the work that I'm doing right now and the work that is ahead in the struggle um, we have to end the blockade. So for people who don't know me, uh, my name is Kala Walsh, I'm 18. I was born and raised on occupied Massachusetts land in what is now known as Cambridge. And I'm currently living in Jojake, or what is now known as Montreal, Quebec, for university. And a month ago, I was elected as one of the co-chairs of the National Network on Cuba, um, or NNOC, which is a national umbrella organization um, for all the organizations around the country that are fighting to end this U.S. war on Cuba that has been going on um, for decades and decades. And I've also been active in the Boston Cuba Solidarity Coalition uh, July 26th for almost a year. And like Deed said, um, I'm on the board of Mass Peace Action. So I got to travel to Cuba in April and May for 18 days with the International May Day Brigade, which NNOC organizes every year. And I returned to Cuba uh, for a week at the end of this November for the historic US Cuba Youth Friendship Meeting. And both of these experiences were, were absolutely life-changing. I feel so thankful to have been able to experience the Cuban revolution and really existing socialism at a young age. Being in a society with, with free healthcare, free education, guaranteed housing, functioning democracy, a society with no gun violence, no class exploitation, no institutionalized discrimination or oppression, that was completely different from the environment that I grew up in in the US empire. So the theme of my speech is children of our environments, which is a phrase from one of the first Che Guevara speeches that I ever read, a speech that really moved me into revolutionary politics. 
We are all children of our environments, he said, and we are shaped by our surrounding conditions, uh, our surrounding systems and the ideologies that maintain them. And for me, learning about Cuba and actually going there challenged everything that my environment at home was telling me, everything that my environment at home had told me about Cuba, about socialism in general. Um, so first, I want to start by telling you how I started learning about Cuba and some of the pieces of writing that were influential on me so that you understand uh, how I came into this work. So I started learning about Cuba after I read the autobiography of revolutionary Asada Shakur, who lives in Cuba today. Asada joined the Black Panther Party as a college student in New York, and as the Black liberation movement surged, the state accelerated to violently repress it. The FBI's secret COINTELPRO program uh, infiltrated revolutionary organizations. It divided and attempted to destroy them from within. Uh, because the Black Panther Party demanded the total liberation of Black people, J. Edgar Hoover called it the greatest threat to the internal security of the country, and he vowed to destroy it and its leaders and its members. So they killed and locked up hundreds of Asada's comrades, and she became a militant freedom fighter with the Black Liberation Army, uh, the BLA, which was activated after a split with the, Panther, with the Panthers' leadership uh, in early 1971. And their militancy was really a defensive measure in response to the ruling class's violent repression of the Panthers and what was effectively a genocide of Black communists and revolutionary leaders. In 1973, Asada and two of her comrades in the BLA, uh, Zaid Malik Shakur and Sanjata Akoli, were pulled over by New Jersey state troopers for a faulty taillight. And the troopers shot and killed Shakur, and they shot and injured Asada and Akoli. One state trooper was also killed, and both Asada and Akoli were shot unarmed, but the state framed them for killing the trooper, and they also framed them for killing their comrade Shakur, even though the other troopers uh, admitted to killing him. They locked her up, and they put her on a sham trial. Um, no news media was ever allowed to interview Asada or Sanjata, while the police and the FBI fed stories full of lies to the press on a daily basis. And Asada was convicted by an all-white jury and sentenced to life plus 33 years in prison. During this time, she got pregnant and gave birth to a daughter. They put her in cages, they tortured her, they deprived her of medical care, deprived her of a fair judicial process, and deprived her of seeing her loved ones and raising her daughter. She constantly feared that she would be murdered in prison under the watch of the guards, like so many other uh, Black Panthers and Black liberation fighters had been. And in 1979, women from the Black Liberation Army and the May 19th Communist Organization liberated Asada from prison. She became the first woman named to the most wanted terrorist list, and she lived underground for five years until 1984 when she appeared in Cuba. We are always inundated with news about uh, supposed political prisoners in Cuba, but I realized Cuba has actually been the place of asylum for hundreds of people fleeing political imprisonment and persecution in the US. Asada said, I'm a 20th century escaped slave. Because of government persecution, I was left with no other choice than to flee from the political repression, racism, and violence that dominate the US government's policy towards people of color. She was granted asylum by the revolutionary Cuban government under the leadership of President Fidel Castro, and she knew the Cubans would never turn her over to the Yankees, even when the U.S. tried to use uh, the violent blockade as leverage for her release. She said she trusted Cuba was a principled country that had been steadfast in its commitment to the principles of liberation. She said that in welcoming uh, Asada and other escaped political prisoners and refugees, she said Cuba was providing asylum for exiles from terrorist regimes like the United States. So Asada and autobiography was probably the first piece of media I really remember consuming that actually said something positive and truthful about Cuba. I read it when I was 17 in the summer before my senior year of high school, and I was going through a period of immense political change. I had started to unlearn a lot of the imperialist propaganda that I realized I'd been absorbing my entire life. And I was also coming to terms with the fact that a lot of the organizing work I was doing was not aligned with my theories of change 
theories that were quickly revolutionizing the more that I learned about the history of resistance to the U.S. empire, like Asada's and like Cuba's. When I was 15, uh, the summer after my first year of high school, that was when I began to get involved and I started organizing for the youth climate strike in Boston. That was my first real political involvement and I felt very radical. I always felt that the US empire had to be dismantled for any of the changes that I wanted to be realized. I knew capitalism and colonialism were the root causes of the climate crisis, which was the issue that, that truly activated me and so many other young people. But I believe I got sucked into um, the cycle of liberal establishment politics and a cycle of de-radicalization that captures so many young people who have revolutionary potential and funnels us into organizations and electoral campaigns and narrow theories of change that will never actually threaten the ruling class. I was mostly concerned with local politics and I was working for Democratic candidates, sometimes incumbents and sometimes primary challengers. I got involved in the lead up to the 2020 election wanting to canvass against Trump, but I quickly realized that Trump was not the problem. It was the system that produced him and enabled him to take power. And as I worked on more elections, I saw how it was not really voters who got to decide at all which candidate won, but campaign donors and super PACs. And above all, I also began to see how some so-called progressive candidates who championed policies like Medicare for all and the Green New Deal for people within the US were still acting as agents of imperialism. Um, so I started to dabble in more radical organizing, sometimes underground and some at the same time I was working on campaigns and I felt very split between these two sides. I was a child of my environment and I didn't know how to break out of it and embrace a new form of struggle, but I knew that the systems that I was working within um, were completely limiting my actual ability to make change. I was so bubbled by my environment that I barely even knew about what other forms of struggle um, existed that I could join. I was canvassing for candidates and speaking to voters about their policies, but I felt like I was lying to people's faces by promising them changes that I knew would only ever exist on paper and couldn't actually be realized um, within a uh, oppressive system. I felt very trapped and I didn't know what to do. But Asada herself was very honest about having overcome her own mistakes and her own miseducation as she joined the movement. So reading um, her work really, really moved me. For example, she talked about how she was embarrassed by the anti-communist propaganda that she had absorbed and repeated. She recalled saying in a discussion that the U.S. was fighting for democracy against communism in Vietnam at the start of the war, when really she had no idea about the history of Vietnam or what communism even was. But her comrades educated her and she committed herself to unlearning this propaganda and challenging uh, the beliefs she previously held. Asada's honesty and humility gave me an example to do the same. She taught me that it was okay to have made mistakes if you confront them and engage in a process of unlearning and dismantling propaganda. I decided to step back from a lot of the liberal and reformist organizing I was doing uh, and to commit myself to political education until I could figure out my next steps. So <clears throat> after I read Asada, one of the next books I read <clears throat> was The Motorcycle Diaries, which is Che Guevara's travel diaries of exploring Latin America when he was still a medical student. And I found a copy of this book in a little used bookstore in Provincetown. And at the end of this copy, there was an appendix with one of Che's later speeches called On Revolutionary Medicine. This speech is also called Child of My Environment, so this is where I'm taking the phrase from. And this is what Che said that really moved me. Almost everyone knows that years ago, I began my career as a doctor. And when I began as a doctor, when I began to study medicine, the majority of concepts I have today as a revolutionary were absent from my store of ideals. Like everyone, I wanted to succeed. I dreamed of becoming a famous medical research scientist, I dreamed of working indefatigably to discover something that would be used to help humanity, but which signified a personal triumph for me. 
I was, as we all are, a child of my environment. I'll stop there because when I read this part of the speech, I saw myself. Like everyone, I wanted to succeed, and my concept of success was that within capitalism, which is individualist, a personal triumph. And this type of success meant pursuing individual goals, usually packaging yourself into a palatable career path and a trajectory into the ruling class. And I had these sort of dreams too, uh, like most people my age and most people under capitalism. Like I said, I was working on campaigns at a very high level for my age. I had already had positions well beyond my age um, as communications director and digital director and a social media consultant for many candidates. And I thought for a long time that I would just continue climbing this ladder in the political worlds, you know, eventually becoming a campaign manager or a chief of staff to some politician. And I thought that I could work within the system to make the change that I wanted to see through my individual success. This is kind of exactly how we are taught history, a classic idealist liberal narrative of history that great individuals are responsible for making historical change and not mass movements. And this is what I had to unlearn. But we were children of our environments, and that environment was the environment of history's most violent and powerful empire, the United States, which always promises us that if we spend enough time working within their systems and institutions, that we can change them from within, and that if only we work hard enough, we can succeed and become the exceptions. Asada discusses this idea in a different way in her book about how the U.S. empire shapes us to be children of our environment. The schools we go to are reflections of the society that created them, she wrote. Nobody is going to give you the education you need to overthrow them. Nobody is going to teach you your true history, teach you your true heroes, if they know that that knowledge will help set you free. Schools in America are interested in brainwashing people with Americanism, giving them a little bit of education, and training them in skills needed to fill the positions the capitalist system requires. As long as we ex expect America's schools, to educate us, we will remain ignorant. Our environment and the US education system prepares us to sell our labor to the capitalist class and it avoids teaching us any skills uh, to think critically or to think of ourselves in relation to the broader world, which of course would expose the realities of US imperialism. So back to Che, um, when Che left his bourgeois environment that he had grown up in in Argentina and started to explore the world, what he saw and experienced outside of that environment forced him to change his dreams of personal triumph and the path of his life. He continues in his speech on revolutionary medicine. After graduation, due to special circumstances and perhaps also to my character, I began to travel throughout the Americas and I became acquainted with all of it. Because of the circumstances in which I traveled, first as a student and later as a doctor, I came in close contact with poverty, hunger, and disease, with the inability to treat a child because of a lack of money, with the stupef stupefaction pro provoked by the continual hunger and punishment to the point that a father can accept the loss of a son as an unimportant accident, which often occurs in the downtrodden classes of our American homeland. And I began to realize at that time that there were things that were almost as important to me as becoming famous or making a significant contribution to medical science. I wanted to help those people. So only when Che uh, stepped outside of his environment and the bourgeois conditions of his childhood, he began to see things differently. He witnessed firsthand the extreme inequality created by imperialism and underdevelopment, or rather over-exploitation in Latin America. Che realized that what would give his life meaning was not just his personal success, but making material change in other people's lives. But he still thought that this change was possible through his abilities as an individual. I wanted to help those people, he said, but I continue to be, as we all continue to be always, a child of my environment. And I wanted to help those people with my personal efforts. I had already traveled a great deal. I was in Guatemala at the time, the Guatemala of Arbenz, and I'd begun to make some notes to guide the conduct of the, of the revolutionary doctor. I began to investigate what was needed to be a revolutionary doctor. After Che witnessed firsthand uh, the CIA and the United Fruit Company backed coup in Guatemala in 1954, which was in response to President Jacobo Arbenz's agrarian reforms, he realized and saw firsthand the, the true unrelenting violence 
of U.S. imperialism. He saw that the U.S. empire would maintain control over the natural resources it needed to exploit at all costs with, with any means of violence. And he also saw that the lack of an armed and unified resistance among the Guatemalan people was what enabled the new fascist regime to seize power. He said, then I realized a fundamental thing. For one to be a revolutionary doctor or to be a revolutionary at all, there must first be a revolution. Isolated individual endeavor, for all its purity of ideals, is of no use. And the desire to sacrifice an entire lifetime to the noblest of ideals serves no purpose if one works alone, solitarily, in some corner of America, fighting against adverse governments and social conditions which prevent progress. To create a revolution, one must have what there is in Cuba, the mobilization of a whole people who learn by the use of arms and the exercise of militant unity to understand the value of arms and the value of unity. There's a lot to unpack there, but the line that stuck out to, the, to me the most and to most people who read the speech is that for one to be a revolutionary doctor or to be a revolutionary at all, there must first be a revolution. Instead of waiting for the revolution to come to him, Che went about creating the revolution alongside others. Instead of pursuing his personal goals and isolated individual endeavor, Che went about mobilizing the masses and empowering them to take their own futures into their own hands. Of course, Che delivered this speech on revolutionary medicine after the Cuban revolution in a very different context than our own. He is setting forth how the Cuban revolution and through its process of building socialism was liberating and redirecting everyone's individual talent to the benefit of all society. For one to be a revolutionary doctor or to be a revolutionary at all, there must first be a revolution. And of course, there is no widespread revolution yet in the US. There is no mobilization of a whole people in militant unity. But what we learn from Cuba is that Cuba shows us what is possible. And what I got from Che's speech, like from reading Asada, were ideas for a path forward. I knew I was still a child of my environment. And now I knew I had to step outside of it and challenge everything that I thought I knew. And I knew that I had to abandon my personal goals of career success within the narrow path that was already laid out for me, a path that I had already felt trapped in. I had to help raise people's consciousness, not further mystify them from capitalist reality, which I felt like I had been doing by promoting these reforms instead of revolution. And I knew I had to engage in mass organizing, which barely took place in the electoral politics I was engaged in, where campaigns are only concerned with reaching the small percentage of people who actually consistently vote. Some people and colleagues thought I was throwing everything away, my connections and job offers and relationships with politicians, and it was hard to step back from these spaces I had committed myself to and where I had built relationships and community for years, but I knew it was right. Uh, my understanding of the world was being complicated, and I knew I had to step outside of my environment and try to find the truth. I started reading a lot more about history, and I joined anti-imperialist organizations. And half a year later, I was in Cuba with the 2022 International May Day Brigade. It had just rained when I landed in Havana in April. The flight from Miami was the first time I remember being on a plane where everyone clapped upon landing. It did deserve applause because it was a real feat that we were there and defying the blockade. I remember starting to talk to the woman sitting next to me who turned out to also be a Cuba solidarity activist. She told me about how she and her husband met on a brigade and returned dozens of times and even got married there in La Casa de Amistad. I was seeing already how Cuba transformed people and the course of their lives. A staffer from ECAP, which is the Cuban Institute of Friendship with the Peoples, who organized the brigades, uh, picked me up. His name was Hugo. I asked if he knew Mary and Sara, and he beamed and said that he loves Mary. And I thought it was very cool that I already had a mutual friend with the very first person that I met in Cuba in the airport. I immediately felt at home. I wrote in my journal that night, it had just rained and the pavement was glowing, the sky so light, the sun breaking clouds through the palm trees. 
rain and gasoline. That was my first smell of Havana. Before you even get to Cuba, you have to reckon with the blockade as you are packing and preparing for your trip. In my bag, I had lots of medicine, thermometers, vitamins, shoes to donate. These are all products that are limited by the blockade. I also had a special box of medicine from a friend of MAPA, uh, Julia Todd, to deliver to her family friends in Havana. The family's elderly father was in se severe pain from his illness, but could not access the pain medications that he needed. I also had piano parts that were shipped to me from London, which I was delivering to a famous Cuban musician, Pablo Menendez. I met Pablo in the airport parking lot that afternoon, and he told me about El Medico de los Pianos, the man who had shipped me the parts from London. El Medico de los Pianos used to run brigades to Cuba just to go around and fix people's pianos, which were often damaged or out of tune due to the shortage of materials and parts caused by the blockade. Pablo was one of Cuba's most celebrated mus musicians, yet he told me that he had no idea how he was getting home from the airport because he had no car and the public transportation in Havana was in its worst state in years. When I was there, buses were running at 40% of the pre-pandemic level because of the shortages of fuel and spare parts and tires. In comparison, I felt ridiculous for complaining about the MBTA here in Boston. How I considered my own environment was changing based on the different reality I was experiencing in Cuba. Very few aspects of daily life in Cuba are not impacted by the blockade in some way. It is crucial to understand its severe impact and the huge limitations it poses to Cuba's development. We also have to remember why the blockade exists. In the State Department's own words, when they put the blockade in place under the JFK administration, it was because the majority of Cubans support Fidel Castro and there is no effective political opposition in the country. So they said, the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. They insisted that every possible means should be undertaken to promptly weaken the economic life of Cuba, and their goal was to make the greatest inroads in denying money and supplies to Cuba, to decrease monetary and real wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. That's all in the State Department's own words. While it obviously has not worked to bring about the overthrow of the Cuban government, it has stolen over $144 billion from the Cuban economy over the years, and it has caused mass immigration waves out of Cuba because of the economic difficulties. The US, of course, wants everyone to think that these economic difficulties exist because of socialism, but the truth is, socialism is the only reason Cuba has managed to survive despite the blockade and surpassed the U.S. in so many measures of social progress, like life expectancy, education rates, literacy rates, and low infant mortality. We cannot understand anything happening in Cuba if we do not understand the blockade, why it exists, and what its impacts are. So the, the sun set while we were still at the airport and we drove to the Julio Antonio Mea International Camp, which is named after one of the founders of the original Communist Party of Cuba. This camp was built by young brigadistas from dozens of countries and has had over 100,000 visitors from around the world staying there in solidarity with Cuba. On the drive there, we drove down with, with rolled down windows. I wrote in my journal that night about how the sky cracked open and the yoke of the stars poured out, dripping onto the shadows of palm trees. We drove for miles and there were no commercial billboards, no outlet malls, no McDonald's, no lifeless suburban gated communities off the highway. It was the first time I had seen the stars that clearly in so long, and we were right around Cuba's biggest city. I watched Orion the entire drive and I could feel the other warriors and revolutionaries watching us from the sky. I was astounded by the lack of light pollution. By 2017, Cuba was the only country with a government-led plan to combat climate change, which includes a 100-year projection. Their plan is called Project Life or Terea Vida, and Cuba is also the only country to have been measured by the UN as actually achieving sustainable development. Almost all food in Cuba is grown organically and often in urban farms. 
After the revolution expropriated land that was being exploited by U.S. companies, forest and green space rapidly grew back in Cuba. In this sense, I was literally the child of a new environment in a society that nurtures and cares for the earth instead of polluting it and tearing it apart. When the sun rose the next morning, I saw Cuba fully in the light. Asada's description of Cuba that I had read was from the 1980s, which was a very different time. It was before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. It was before the difficult special period that followed, before the Obama thaw and the death of Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro, and also before the harsh economic downturn that has happened in recent years under Trump's 243 added sanctions and the COVID pandemic and global fuel shortages and the economic crisis resulting from the war in Ukraine. But so much of what Asada described, I saw true still every day in Cuba. She wrote in her book, the first thing that hit me were the open doors. Everywhere you go, doors are open wide. You see people inside their homes, talking, working, or watching television. I was amazed to find that you could actually walk down the streets at night alone. Cuba was the first time in her words that she lived in a society that was not at war with itself, where there is a sense of community. She said, it's a given in Cuba that if you fall down, the person next to you is going to help you get up. I saw exactly this too. I felt for the first time a society that is not at war with itself. It goes without saying that Cuba has plenty of problems and contradictions and issues that need changing, and no one is more aware of that than the Cuban revolutionaries themselves. But under capitalism, with its class antagonisms, every society is at war with itself, as the ruling class exploits workers, the workers resist, their resistance breeds repression, and repression breeds more resistance. Through building socialism, Cuba has eliminated these antagonisms and eliminated class exploitation, and that is the fundamental difference. As the base structure of society, socialism transforms every other aspect, uh, from art to culture to religion, science, philosophy, law, and simply how people organize and relate themselves to each other. Staying at the international camp um, and experiencing this different way of organizing ourselves into a community and relating to each other was really an experience like no other. We rose with the sun every morning to the sound of a rooster crowing and then Guantanamera playing over the loudspeakers or sometimes speeches from Fidel. It was the first time I ever enjoyed waking up early. I loved our meals at the camp because I had time to sit with all the other brigadistas from dozens of countries and talk about our lives and our struggles. A lot of people were surprised that I was 17, but no one treated me differently or judged me because of my age. I had never met so many radical elders before and I loved hearing about their experiences and the lifetimes of work that they had committed to the revolution. We were all children of incredibly different environments, but we were united around Cuba. I met people who had gone on the very first solidarity brigades to Cuba and who were followed and harassed by the FBI for their work. I met people who had traveled to the DPRK in North Korea and studied in the Soviet Union. I met trade unionists from England and South Africa and Brazil. One of the South Africans was from Swaziland, and he taught me about the struggle in his home country, one of the only places in the world still under feudal, feudal monarchical rule. I met people from the U.S. who had participated in the sit-in in the Venezuelan embassy and were arrested and persecuted. There was a father from Angola who brought his two young children, less than 10 years old, and immersed them in the brigade. I met former, U former U.S. Army officials who are now peace activists. I became friends with a student from Mexico who had his graduation ceremony over Zoom while we were in Cuba, and he became the first in his family to get a degree. We got lost together in downtown Havana with a Chilean political muralist and a little old lady who was being persecuted in Peru for her involvement in a leftist party. We barely spoke each other's languages, but we all connected as comrades and friends. We learned about the struggle in Cuba and we shared the struggles in each of our own countries, building real internationalism. On international night at the camp, each country's delegation performed and showcased an aspect of our culture. For the US delegation, of course, this process was a little more complicated since we are so ununited and there is no real cohesive national identity. Instead of a US flag, we had a Pan-African flag we wrote a skit about a classroom of students protesting the Pledge of Allegiance. 
And then our compañero Yamir performed a rap calling for revolution across all of the Americas. Despite all of our differences between our different countries and even within our countries, there was always a sense of unity around Cuba. Every day on the brigade, we had different activities. We did farm work, we cleaned the camp, we visited workplaces and met with unions. We went to different historical and cultural sites like the Jose Marti Memorial and the Fidel Castro Center. The Castro Center is the only place or entity in Cuba named after Fidel, which I was really interested to learn. Fidel never wanted to build a cult of personality, so he disallowed any streets or buildings to be named after him. The only exception was this museum and educational center that was built about Fidel's life and the revolution after his passing. Inside the center is the only existing bust or statue of Fidel in Cuba, which was given as a gift by Chinese President Xi Jinping in 2014. We also got to participate in the May Day Brigade or in the May Day Parade on May 1st, which was the biggest march I've ever seen in my entire life, and I've been to a lot of marches and protests. It was the first May Day march since the pandemic and millions of Cubans joined around the country to march in defense of the accomplishments of the revolution against the onslaught of U.S. imperialism. It was a huge sea of people that seemed like it would never end. People marching with their workplaces, holding pictures of Che and Fidel and Raul and Camilo Cienfuegos and Vilma Espin and other revolutionary leaders, waving flags not just from Cuba, but revolutionary countries across the world, including Palestine. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. We learned from leaders of Cuba's mass organizations like the Committees in Defense of the Revolution, the Federation of Cuban Women, and the Cuban Young Communist League, or UJC. This was how I met Diana Castillo, one of the leaders in the international department of the UJC. She explained how the Cuban people and youth are the subjects, not the objects of the revolution. They are at the forefront of every revolutionary transformation in Cuba. Diana is an international relations student, and now she's 25, but as part of her study program at 18, she, like other students, served in one of the special military brigades at the border of the U.S. naval base in illegally occupied Guantanamo Bay. I remember her talking about the sheer anger and disgust they felt hearing the U.S. soldiers sing the U.S. national anthem every morning on, Cuba, on stolen Cuban soil. I realized that Cuban youth people my age were willing to go up in arms against the biggest, most violent empire in the history of the world to defend their homeland. A couple of days later, we took a long bus all the way down the narrow island to Guantanamo. We stopped in Santa Clara where Che won a decisive battle of the Cuban revolution and we visited his mausoleum. This was definitely one of the most moving parts of the brigade for me. Inside of the museum were artifacts, clothing, journals, rifles from Che's expeditions around the world. Che is the truest expression of proletarian internationalism. He inspired revolutions around the globe and continues to. He aided revolutions in countries he had never been to, countries whose language he didn't speak. Our tour guide invited me to leave a note inside of the guest book at the memorial since I was the youngest person on the trip. And that was one of the greatest honors of my life. I recalled the quote from Che's father that he said after Che's death. He said, the first thing to note is that in my son's veins flowed the blood of Irish rebels. I felt a deep connection to Che carrying on the anti-imperialist struggle that our ancestors in Ireland have been fighting against British colonialism for nearly a thousand years. I knew we were all interconnected across space and time, and I felt like Cuba was a real nucleus for our struggle. As we got closer to the eastern part of the island and the Sierra Maestra, where the July 26th movement launched the revolution, it felt like we were getting closer to its heart. We passed many beautiful rounded hills on which Yo Soy Fidel was spelled out in huge white rocks so that it was visible to us from the highway. The people's proximity to the U.S. naval base has heightened the anti-imperialist consciousness of the local residents, the Guantanamo provincial leaders explained to us. We were there to participate in the 7th International Seminar on Peace and Abolishing Foreign Military Bases, 
And delegates from around the world, the Caribbean, Europe, South America, even the Philippines, had flown in to show how their communities and environments were devastated by U.S. militarism. Most host countries to U.S. foreign military bases support the presence of these bases, even if it hurts their local populations. But the key difference about Guantanamo is that the host government, Cuba, has long opposed the existence of the base and called for its removal. The occupation is completely illegal and unjust, and it has gone on for well over 120 years. We learned about how strategically important the base is for the U.S., which has used it to launch invasions of Haiti, Puerto Rico, and other countries. After the revolution, the naval base was also used as a site for the CIA to support counter-revolutionary terrorist organizations attempting to overthrow the Cuban government. We visited the community closest to the base, Caimanera. When you drive into the town, you pass a billboard that reads, Caimanera, the first anti-imperialist trench. We were physically right up on the border of the empire and the revolution. You could feel the tension in the air. We could only see the U.S. base with binoculars from a lookout point, but you feel its impact everywhere because residents of the Guantanamo province are prevented from accessing their beaches, their fishing waters, and their deep seaport, which really hurts the local economy. U.S. militarism also pollutes and destroys the surrounding environment. We learned that Guantanamo is the youngest province in Cuba with the biggest youth population. I thought a lot about the hypocrisy of the U.S., the biggest human rights violator in the world, to constantly be lambasting Cuba for so-called human rights violations. As far as I know, the only human rights violations on Cuban soil are happening in the U.S. torture camp in their illegally occupied territory at Guantanamo Bay. We were on the bus back from Guantanamo when we found out about the Hotel Saratoga explosion in early May. My friend sitting next to me on the bus got a text from her friend in the US asking if we were all okay. All we knew was that there had been an explosion and we instinctively worried that it was a political attack and we worried whether our comrades who weren't in Guantanamo with us were okay. The CIA and Cuban exile terrorist groups have committed many counter-revolutionary bombings, including at hotels uh, in Cuba or targeting Cuban embassies or officials in other countries. During this week of international solidarity, we were very worried that there was an attack targeting activists and revolutionaries. We found out later that it was a gas leak, an accidental gas leak, and 47 people, mostly workers, were tragically killed. It was devastating, and the entire country of Cuba stopped and came together. Thousands were lining up to donate blood and give supplies to the families impacted. Nightlife and cultural events were slowed down or canceled for several days while the nation mourned. I was surprised by how Cuba mourned because I was a child of my environment. In every capitalist system, we are wholly normalized and desensitized to mass preventable deaths. Especially in the U.S., a country built by white supremacist violence and vigilantism with the prevalence of mass shootings and murder. There are way too many atrocities to have time to process or mourn them all here. Seeing how Cuba responded to tragedy and actually processed and mourned made me realize this and made me realize how my own environment had deeply desensitized me. There were still vestiges of the old, but Cuba made me a child of a new environment. I didn't see my political work as an isolated individual endeavor, but a collective endeavor with new comrades from around the world. It is always hard to adjust back into our harsh, alienating capitalist reality, but I came back from Cuba more committed to organizing to end the blockade and to build a revolution in the belly of the beast. I try to talk about Cuba with everyone, no matter their politics, wherever I go. Have you ever been to Cuba, I ask? Would you like to go? Do you know that a blockade exists? Do you know why the U.S. doesn't want you to go to Cuba? Don't you think you have the right to travel there? Even if I cannot turn them into a socialist right away, I can always complicate people's existing understanding of Cuba. I can challenge their misconceptions that come with being children of our environments because I grew up in the same environment and I understand where they are coming from. I did not expect to be able to return to Cuba so soon, but I was invited to participate in 
the U.S.-Cuba Youth Friendship Meeting this November, a historic meeting of solidarity between U.S. and Cuban youth. I felt even more at home my second time in Cuba. I ran into comrades that I already knew in the Miami airport, and Hugo picked us up again. The U.S. delegates on this trip were all from different parties and organizations, but one of our biggest takeaways from our workshops and discussion was the overwhelming need for unity among socialists, among peace activists, among everyone on the left in the U.S. We waste so much time infighting and attacking each other when we should be working together to impose our government's imperialist violence. We cannot afford to waste time fighting each other when we need to unite in solidarity with Cuba. What was also most different about this trip was that we got to spend most of our time with Cuban youth, children of the revolutionary environment. My friend Diana Castillo, who I met in May, was one of the lead organizers of the meeting along with the Cuban Young Communist League and the Cuban Federations of University and High School Students. We learned so much from them, especially on issues that are deeply important to youth in the US. For example, we learned that gun violence is a non-existent issue in Cuba. Communities have armories in the case of a U.S. invasion, and adults are responsibly trained to use guns, but there is virtually no private ownership and no shootings. We learned that abortion is free and widely available. We learned about the newly passed Families Code and the role youth played in advancing LGBTQ rights in Cuba. We learned about how Cuban youth use social media to organize like we do. We even learned about which dating apps they use in Cuba. We learned that students in Cuba only have the job of being students and that they receive payment even if their studies are part-time. When they are teacher's assistants, research assistants, or interns, they are always paid. I can't imagine how much better I'd be doing in school if I did not have to work multiple jobs in order to pay for it. All school in Cuba is free, of course. We saw how Cuban youth are empowered to work at the very forefront of the revolution and to constantly be challenging leaders and pushing it forward. Each of us, Cuban youth and U.S. youth, were children of our environments in our own ways, but we had more in common than we did apart. And by engaging with each other and building mutual solidarity, we were defying the violent sanctions that the U.S. puts in place to keep us apart. Visiting Elon, the Latin American School of Medicine, was one of the highlights of this trip. I had heard so much about Elon from my friends and comrades who had graduated from there and were now practicing doctors and from my friends I met who were currently studying there, but I had never seen the campus itself. In 1998, after a devastating hurricane season in Latin America and the Caribbean, Fidel converted the campus from a naval base into a beautiful medical school, which is now the biggest in the world and completely free for all students, including those from the US. The only condition for their scholarship is that upon graduation, they go and practice in an underserved community. Over 30,000 students from different countries have graduated from Elam. The Cubans described the environment of Elam at the end of the 20th century as, or the Cubans described the establishment of Elam at the end of the 20th century as the establishment of a new century where vulnerable people could come here and build a revolutionary army, an army of doctors. This is exactly aligned with Fidel's philosophy of how Cuba built diplomacy and strong relationships and comradeship with other countries through doctors, not bombs. We are a small country with a big heart, the Elam director told us. We tell students studying here that they are not foreigners. They are Cubans by studying here. Here, Fidel is alive. In each of us, Fidel is alive. The biggest contingent of students at Elam are from Palestine. I got to talk with many of these students who had left their lives and family in Palestine so they could train as doctors in Cuba and then return to serve under the violence of the Zionist occupation, where doctors are desperately needed to treat Palestinians who are daily bombed, brutalized, and sanctioned from access accessing medical care by the occupation. This sort of medical internationalism is in line with Cuba's historic solidarity with Palestine. After the triumph of the revolution, Raul Castro and Che Guevara visited Gaza a few months later. Cuba supported the Palestine Liberation Organization and provided political, educational, and military support to the Fatah Organization, as well as the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Democratic Front, the second and third largest organizations in the PLO. 
Cuba sponsored the successfully passed UN resolution that branded Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination. Cuba also gave strong support to the mass Palestinian intifada that began in late 18, 1987. During the occupation's 2014 assault on Gaza, which killed more than 1,400 Palestinians and wounded over 10,000, Fidel wrote, Why does the government of this country, meaning the Israeli occupying state, think that the world will be impervious to this genocide that is being committed today against the Palestinian people. As part of their project of settler colonialism and genocide, the Israeli occupation routinely targets and murders Palestinian medical professionals and medics. Being a doctor should be one of the safest positions to hold in society, but to be a Palestinian doctor standing in the way of the occupation's genocide is an extremely dangerous and risky role. The students we spoke to said that Cuba was an example for them, that Cuba, a tiny country, had managed to overthrow and defy the U.S., the world's largest empire, for over 60 years. They said Cuba gave them hope that no matter how much support the Israeli occupation got from the U.S., Palestine would always prevail and the revolutionary spirit of the Palestinian people would always prevail, just like the Cubans have under blockade and siege and invasion. Cuba's example of hope is one that I thought a lot about during our trip. Despite their adverse conditions and the daily violences of the blockade with shortages of products, electricity blackouts, limitations on medications and fuel and food that they can import, and despite the fact that this blockade does not have to seem any, or does not seem to have any end in sight, the Cubans are incredibly hopeful. They have more hope for people of the U.S. to organize our own revolution than we do for ourselves. They believe in us, which tells me that we need to believe in ourselves and organize ourselves too. Cuba's medical internationalism extends well beyond students from Palestine and the U.S. For the past six decades, more than 400,000 Cuban medical professionals have worked in 164 countries and improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Cuba's Henry Reeve Medical Brigades are named after Henry Reeve, a New York-born soldier who fought in the Cuban Liberation Army during the Wars of Independence in the 1800s. Fidel established this brigade in 2005 to respond to disasters around the world, and Cuban doctors are currently active in over 50 countries. After 9-11 and after Hurricane Katrina, Cuba prepared huge contingents of doctors and supplies ready to respond to these disasters. The U.S. refused them. This shows how the blockade primarily hurts Cubans, but it also hurts people from the U.S. We could benefit from Cuba's incredible medical innovations like the world's first successful lung cancer vaccine, but the U.S. blockades it. We could benefit from Cuba's diabetes treatments, which could save 100,000 diabetes patients in the U.S. from being amputated each year. But the U.S. does not care about human life, even those, um, even the human life of its own citizens. It cares about crushing Cuba and making the Cuban people suffer. It cares about preventing any of its own U.S. citizens from seeing the truth about Cuba and realizing what we are missing. On both of my trips, we got to visit several biotechnological centers, the Center of Molecular Immunology and the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, where we heard about these amazing innovations. Cuba had to develop its own capacity to produce medicine because of the blockade and especially after the fall of the Soviet Union. Fidel knew that Cuba's scientific and medical talent would help them survive the special period, so he created huge investments in this area. We met with young scientists who had led the development of Cuba's five successful vaccine candidates against COVID. They said that their age demographics really distinguished their centers from most other scientific institutions because young people were leading the research. Cuba's vaccine rollout was delayed because the U.S. blocked them from buying syringes. But a solidarity campaign in the U.S., led by global health partners and the Saving Lives campaign, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to deliver 6 million syringes and tons of PPE to Cuba. The U.S. even blocked Cuba from buying respirators and oxygen during the pandemic. The barbarism of the blockade never ends. One of the most glaring differences between the U.S. and Cuba is how they handled the COVID pandemic. 
Cuba shows us that it is actually possible to defeat the pandemic and that mass death from COVID is not inevitable. Cuba has the highest percentage of doctors in the world and Cuba already has or already had a national pandemic response strategy before their first COVID death. Cuba told people with COVID to stay home instead of forcing them to go to work, like so many low-wage workers were forced in the U.S. by corporations determined to maintain their profits. Each day of the pandemic, Cuban medical students knocked on doors to check in on residents and survey them to obtain medical data, which was used to inform and directly plan Cuban health policy. By July 2020, Cuba had 87 COVID deaths, while the U.S. had 140,000. While the U.S. Po uh, population is 30 times that of Cuba, it had 1,613 times as many deaths. And Cuba spends less than a tenth as much per person per year on healthcare than does the U.S. But even with good policy, Cuba's pandemic response would not have been so successful without the immense trust that people have in science and their healthcare system, which, like I said, is completely free for all Cubans. Deadly misinformation and science denial was not allowed to spread. Cubans are very well educated generally on science and health. So social distancing, masks, contact tracing were universally accepted. When we traveled Cuba in April, I was shocked to see everyone still masking inside and outside in Cuba. It was because Cubans understand and trust the science and their healthcare system, but also because of the collectivist nature of Cuban society because of the strengths of their communities and their desire to uplift and protect everyone and sacrifice no one. In my environment, I had been conditioned to think that this was just impossible, that people are too selfish and don't have it within themselves to give up small comforts in order to protect all of society. Our government in the U.S. told us that mass death from COVID was unpreventable and inevitable, but Cuba's example shows us otherwise and gives us hope. When the system actually invests in the people and values human life, people respond much better. Between 2019 and 2021, life expectancy in the U.S. dropped almost three years, while for Cuba, it grew for by a few months and even surpassed the U.S. As of 2021, the life expectancy in Cuba is 79, and in the U.S., it is 76. Another health, health issue deeply important to young people in the U.S. is reproductive rights. When I was in Cuba in the spring, the news first broke about the draft U.S. Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Hearing the news about Roe v. Wade outside of my normal environment while in revolutionary Cuba put the reactionary decision in a very different context. That's because Cuba is the first country in Latin America and North America to legalize abortion. Abortion and contraceptives are free and easily accessible, as with all healthcare services. Abortion was first legalized in Cuba in 1936 in cases of rape, risk to the birth giver's life, or the possibility of passing on a serious disease to the fetus. Before the 1959 revolution, Cubans lived through a period of U.S. neocolonialism, and private medical clinics thrived by offering U.S. health tourists services like abortion that were not available in the U.S. But during this time, Cuba had the second highest rural infant and maternal death rates in Latin America, and most Cubans had no health access to health care, especially outside of the capital. There was only one rural hospital in the entire country, and abortion was effectively only legal for Cubans who could afford it, which is a reality that we still face in the U.S. Only with socialism and the expansion of free health care to all came the full actualization of abortion rights in Cuba. After the triumph of the revolution in 1959, health outcomes improved immediately. Cuba now has the most doctors per capita in the world, and it even has um, higher life expectancy and lower maternal mortality rates than the U.S. Full access to abortion was institutionalized in 1965 on four basic grounds. It is the woman who decides, it needs to take place at a hospital, it needs to be carried out by expert staff, and it needs to be totally free. The only criminalization of abortion in Cuba is when it is done for profit outside of health institutions by non-medical staff or against a patient's will. Thanks to the widespread availability of abortion and public trust in the health system, the issue is much less stigmatized in Cuba than it is in the U.S. 
The precariousness of reproductive rights and all rights in the U.S. also bears sharp contrast to life in Cuba, where it would be unimaginable for the government to strip away health care for millions of people with a single vote, let alone a vote between nine unelected justices. But most North, most North Americans are still convinced that we live in a functional democracy while Cubans live in a totalitarian dictatorship. Learning about reproductive rights and gender equality in Cuba led me to learn a lot more about their system of socialist democracy. Cuba's constitution was revised and voted upon by the masses through a democratic and consultative process in 2019. This constitution not only guarantees the right to free medical care, but it also enforces gender equality in all aspects of society, including sexual and reproductive rights. The U.S. Constitution does not mention women at all, and it would be unimaginable for North Americans, for us to participate in community debate and national referendums on our constitution, which has barely changed since it was written by a handful of slave owners 235 years ago. When we were there in the spring, the new Cuban Families Code, which concerns women rights, familial rights, and LGBTQ rights, was still under debate. From February to April 22, more than 76% of the Cuban population participated in more than 79,000 community meetings to debate and discuss and revise the bill. Cubans made over 400,000 proposals that led to the revision of over half the documents. Even the 1.3 million Cubans living abroad were invited to participate in this process through an online form. The final revised draft was approved by the National Assembly in June, and the September it was ratified in a public referendum. The Families Code is the most progressive piece of social policy in the world, and it was approved by 67% of the population. While Western media has portrayed it as simply a vote to legalize gay marriage, the Families Code contains so much more. It completely redefines what a family is considered under the law so that parental rights can now be shared among non-traditional family structures, including grandparents, step-parents, and surrogate parents. It promotes the equal distribution of domestic responsibilities amongst genders and all household members. It extends labor rights to those who care full-time for children, the elderly, and people with disabilities. It says that parents have a responsibility for children rather than custody over them, and they must be respectful of the dignity and physical and mental integrity of children and adolescents. It says that parents should grant their maturing kids more say over their own lives and futures. It affirms that everyone has a right to a family life free from violence. If a parent decides to disown an LGBTQ child, that is considered domestic violence and it is punished accordingly. Gender-affirming care has been free for everyone in Cuba since 2010. This really contrasts to the U.S., where elected officials are promoting the mass murder of trans and queer people. When I was in Cuba a couple of weeks ago, we had the incredible opportunity to observe Cuban democracy and elections firsthand. Cuba held elections for its organs of local governments, the municipal assemblies of people's power on November 27th. Coming from the fundamentally undemocratic U.S. empire, it was the first time that many of our delegates saw an actually functional electoral system in which the masses actually participate and in which the majority truly rules. Here I'm reading from some of the articles that Dean mentioned that I published in Multipolarista and other outlets, so please check those out if you want to see pictures um, and links to more resources about Cuban democracy. There are some great pictures of the polling places. So we observed voting in La Corbata, which is a neighborhood in Havana currently undergoing transformation. The polling site was inside this newly constructed cultural technological center, which also houses arts programs, classes for adults and children, a computer lab, a video center, school graduations, birthday parties, and community events. We had visited the center earlier in the week for an incredible tour and dance performance uh, from a mix of local dancers and students at the National School of Dance who were trained together. When we first arrived at the polling site, I was surprised by how efficiently the voting process moved. There were not long lines at the polling site. While in the US, it is typical for voters, especially in poor neighborhoods, to wait in line for hours to cast their ballot. A local election official explained the entire process to us. 
She said that all citizens and permanent residents of Cuba are automatically registered to vote at 16. So all the Cuban youth delegates on our trip left that morning to go vote in their communities, even the ones who were still in high school. At 18, they are eligible to be nominated as a delegate. This reinforced to me how arbitrary and ridiculous the age restrictions in US elections are. The nomination process for candidates happens in the weeks leading up to the elections in Cuba. Between October 21st and November 18th, more than 6 million voters, which is 73% of those eligible, attended the neighborhood assemblies for the nominations of candidates. Nominations are chosen by members of local community groups, including the Committees in Defense of the Revolution, which is the country's largest mass organization. It has more than 8.4 million members out of a population of 11 million, which is just incredible. Also, the Cuban Federation of Women, whose membership includes more than 85% of all eligible Cuban women over age 14, and the Communist Party of Cuba. The Communist Party of Cuba is not an electoral party. It does not handpick candidates, as the U.S. claims, and party membership is not a requirement to run for office at all. Before the elections, the National Electoral Council goes house to house to verify all voters' information. This year, after Hurricane Ian devastated the Pinar del Rio province in the West, election officials surveyed people still evacuated or sheltering there to ensure that they would still be able to vote. What might be shocking to people from the US is a government that actually wants people to vote. Cuban elections are always held on Sundays so that voters are not restricted by their work days to participate in democracy. On November 27th, the polls opened at 7 a.m. and were scheduled to close at 6 p.m., but the National Electoral Council used their power granted by the Constitution to extend the polling hours throughout the entire country for one more hour so that a greater number of citizens could exercise their right to vote. In the U.S., elections that are scheduled on Tuesdays during work hours, combined with the inaccessibility of polling sites, strict ID requirements, racist voter intimidation, and a general lack of civic education, that impedes most of the working class in the U.S. from participating. The U.S. also pushes the ridiculous falsehood that Cuban elections are not competitive. In reality, every Cuban municipality must have at least two to eight candidates running in order to ensure that voters have a choice. In La Corbata, three candidates were running, all of, whom, all of whom were women, and the election official who was explaining the process to us joked that we should know men are still allowed to run because there were no men on the ballot in that neighborhood. In the November 22 midterms in the U.S. for comparison, less than 8% of congressional districts were even considered competitive. Competitiveness in the U.S. elections has continued to plummet as corporations expand their monopolies and buy up every single race. When I got my first ballot to vote this fall, almost none of the races were even competitive. Even when I did have a choice between candidates, the Democratic incumbents were the only ones with any chance of winning and no third parties, of course. When Cuban voters enter their polling station, they confirm their voter information, receive a ballot with straightforward instructions, and fill it out in a booth. Then they place their ballot in a box guarded by local elementary school students. Youth have always worked at the forefront of the Cuban revolution, so it is a very important role for them. They salute when someone submits their ballot into the box. The children guard the ballot boxes and not the police and not the official government officials. Any citizen can assist in the public vote counting process. Another big contrast from the US is how official results are reported the same day in Cuba. Here it takes weeks or even months to tally votes, despite being the richest country in the world with access to much more advanced technology than Cuba. If no candidate receives over 50% of the vote in Cuba, the election moves to a runoff the following Sunday. That was the case in over 900 of Cuba, Cuba's municipalities after the November elections. And once their representatives begin their terms, the communities can recall them at any point. The electoral official who spoke to us says this is very uncommon, but still this constant mechanism for accountability from the people exists with the representatives. Another key difference between US and Cuban, or Cuban elections is that in Cuba, there is no traditional campaigning. In the U.S., crowds of campaign volunteers or paid workers gather outside polling places holding signs, passing out literature, and urging voters to support their candidates. 
I have never voted in person at a polling place in the US, but I spent plenty of time on election days campaigning outside when I was younger. Most voters had no idea who was up for the election besides Congress or Senate. Many people I talked to had no idea that state representatives and state senators even existed. In Austin one year, I was working on a state representative campaign and I was at the same polling place as the incumbent candidate that we were challenging in a primary. A voter outside asked me what the difference was between our candidates, and I started to explain how our opponent was bought off by luxury developers who were gentrifying the neighborhood. Our opponent, who was standing there, also passing out pamphlets, overheard me and interrupted our conversation to start yelling at me and justifying his donations from developers and ranting about how he didn't come from a life of privilege. He asked me where I lived and where I went to school and why I was there in his neighborhood um, working for a candidate who was challenging him um, and that I had no right to be there. I remember other instances of volunteers getting into physical fights, blocking others, each other's supporters from entering the polling place or blasting loud music to disrupt polling sites. Political violence often escalates outside of polling sites in the US. During the 2022 midterm elections, there were even armed militias intimidating voters in some states. Needless to say, this would all be completely unrecognizable at a Cuban polling site. The community nominated candidates cannot spend any money on campaigning, but they are still accessible to voters to discuss any issues. Candidate biographies highlighting their experience serving the community and their membership in different organizations are posted outside of the polling place for voters to read. So voters make an informed decision based on the candidate's genuine qualifications, not on flashy campaign mailers or attack ads made by super PACs. In the US and all capitalist democracies, elections are determined by the amount of money invested in campaign, which buys advertisements, mailers, staff, and other resources to reach likely voters. A record-breaking $9.3 billion was spent on federal elections during the 2022 U.S. midterms. Political campaigns in the U.S. more closely resemble reality TV shows. They are sensational, polarizing, and completely divorced from the material issues at hand. For example, when I was 15 and 16 and working on the 2020 Massachusetts Senate race, the Joe Kennedy III campaign took screenshots of my and others' tweets and put them in a press release and brought them up at debates um, and in the press to try and make teenagers bullying him online into a campaign issue. <laughs> it's incredible how many campaigns are decided by social scandal and not actual political stances. I think North Americans' shallow conception of democracy contributes to their confusion about the Cuban system. Some believe ridiculous anti-communist propaganda claiming that Cuba is staging its elections or paying actors to tell us lies. Most people in the U.S. would not recognize what real democracy looks like if it walked up and slapped them in the face. With the destruction of capitalism also comes the full realization of democracy. Socialism, which is the common ownership of production, distribution and exchange under the political rule of the working class masses, that is the most democratic form of society that, be con that can be constructed. Before the revolution, Cuba was ruled by a series of U.S.-backed dictators, and before that, direct U.S. military rule and Spanish colonialism. Today, Cuba has a people-powered, consultative, socialist democracy that is centuries ahead of the U.S. in terms of grassroots participation and its social achievements. Sadly, for many in the U.S., it is easier to believe that Cuba is lying about their democratic achievements than to come to terms with the fact that our own government is choosing to deny us those same rights. How could a country just 90 miles away provide all of its citizens with health care, housing, education, and reproductive freedom free of cost when we have been told our entire lives that we do not deserve those same achievements and that they are physically impossible? This is why Cuba is so important. Cuba shows us what is possible. Nothing I've said today about Cuba's incredible achievements is to romanticize their reality or to diminish the harsh effects of the blockade. Cuba is still in its early stages of socialist development and many contradictions still exist. 
Life in Cuba is hard because of the US blockade and hybrid warfare. But when I go to Cuba, what I have shared with you today is what Cubans want to see, the difficulties of the blockade, but also what they have accomplished despite of it. They want us to share the truth about their country, which obviously challenges the lies that most people in the US believe that Cuba is a failed state, like Biden said. And the Cubans want us to organize and revolutionize our own communities. Cuba has kept their revolution alive for over 60 years despite all odds. And revolution in the rest of the Americas will not be possible without their example and their solidarity. In a speech to the first Latin American Youth Congress in July of 1960, Che said exactly this. Cuba is subject to attacks. We are attacked a great deal because of what we are but we are attacked much, much more because we show to each nation of the Americas what it's possible to be. When I went to Cuba, I found out that Asada Shakur, who lives there to this day, used to hang out with brigadistas from the US when they visited. She did an interview with Pastors for Peace in 2000, and 40 years after Che, she gave her own similar reasoning for why the blockade still exists. She said, all of the maneuvers by the US government to keep the blockade alive is a manipulation by the US government because Cuba poses a threat. The real reason Cuba poses a threat has nothing to do with my being here or anyone else being here. It's because Cuba is an example of a country that is actively fighting against imperialist domination and insists on its own right to self-determination and sovereignty. The US government's most acute fear is that other countries are going to follow the Cuban example. They want everyone to know that if you do follow this example, they will attack you in every way they can. That is the reality that I see about the blockade and why it is being continued. Asada is right, but I believe that we will end the blockade. The blockade is hurting Cubans and it is hurting the rest of the world by depriving us of our right to learn from and show our love to the Cuban people. Despite the horrific actions of our government, Cuba has always, always shown their love to us. Every movement we make in solidarity counts, no matter how small. We need to be educating our communities about the reality in Cuba. Join an organization that is part of our national network on Cuba and start to get involved. Go to our standouts. There's one in Coolidge Corner on December 18th at noon um, in, in Boston. Go to caravans. They happen every month and you can organize your own if you don't have one happening near you. They're also in Western Mass for people um, tuning in from Western Mass. Go to Cuba yourself and, and bring back the truth to the U.S. Write about it, talk about it, share it wide and far. Uplift the voices directly from the Cuban people. Pressure your elected officials to stand up against the genocidal blockade. Every action counts. It is hard to imagine an end to the blockade in sight, but I know that it is possible. When I was in Cuba, I got to meet with Fernando and Gerardo, two of the Cuban Five, who were five political prisoners in the US for about 16 years. No one thought they would ever be freed, but thanks to pressure from a mass movement around the world, today they are living back in Cuba and continuing to serve the revolution. Cuba's example is shining brighter and brighter as the Western world devolves into fascism. Young people and old people across the world are realizing it. We are building a multi-generational movement that stands in solidarity with the revolution against the US war on Cuba. When I am in Cuba, I can feel Che and Asada and all the people who have given up their lives struggling against US imperialism for a better future for us all. I believe that we will end the blockade, and I'm only 18, but I believe it will end in my lifetime and the lifetimes of all my young Cuban comrades and hopefully our older comrades too. We just have to be willing to fight for it. Cuba has made me the child of a new environment. It's impossible to put that into words, but I hope some of the stories and observations that I've shared have conveyed how meaningful and impactful my visits to Cuba have been. If anyone listening wants to get involved but doesn't know how, you can find me online and reach out and I would be more than happy to talk more about my experience and help you get plugged into organizing. We are also doing a report back and a Q&A tomorrow night with NNOC, other US delegates and several Cuban youth will be joining. I think someone might have dropped that in the chat. You can also find the information at nnoc.org.
We are all children of our environments and we all have a duty, especially those of us inside of this empire, to challenge what we are told to think and believe. We must step outside of the sphere of empire, like by going to Cuba and learn what it took Cuba to break free so we can do the same. For one to be a revolutionary doctor or to be a revolutionary at all, there must first be a revolution. So we must go about creating it. One of our last nights in Havana this November, we, the Cuban and US youth delegates, were sitting in a circle under the stars, sharing cigars and poems and raps. It was one of the most beautiful moments I have experienced, uh, sharing our poems in dozens of different languages about the struggle and about building a better future. So I thought I would end off by sharing this one that I wrote. Um, I wrote it in February in a workshop with the People's Forum and the class was themed around the idea of daring to invent the future. So this poem is called To Invent. To invent a future without binaries is unthinkable by the laws of design. Our tongues haven't tasted the new words we will write and put in every dictionary, but I already know its smell. Sage and weed, smoke mixing in summer city air, heat simmering from the pavement. I wonder if the stars will ever reappear. I'd remember to look up at the sky and never think about work in my dreams. Only dark magic than endless light. A constitution written in poem. Prisons overgrown with wildflowers. New forests weaving back together what was so violently separated with strips of concrete. And yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much again for having me and for giving me this opportunity to speak. Cultivo una rosa blanca en junio como en enero. Cultivo una rosa blanca en junio como en enero para mi amigo sincero que me da la mano franca y para el cruel que me arranca el corazón con que vivo y para el cruel que me arranca el corazón con que vivo cardos ni orugas cultivo Cultivo una rosa blanca. That's, of course, two verses from Guantanamera, and I'll, I'll translate it for you. It says, I plant a white rose in June as in January. I plant a white rose in June as in January for my sweet friend who gives me their sincere hand, and for he who would tear out the heart which gives me life. And for he who would tear out the heart which gives me life, I don't plant thistles or thorns, I plant a white rose. Thank you, Kala. That was phenomenal. And um, we lost Emma's revolution. They had uh, another meeting, probably another UU church service to, uh, to attend to. Um, and uh, so th that's, that's our final music. And, um, as we as we uh, go on to the Q and A, I was I was just thinking, Kala, so much back on my own eighteen year old experience, <laughs> and it it just makes me realize how remarkable um, you are and how lucky we are to have you have delivered that uh, address. Um, and we will have a Q&A, but a couple announcements. Uh, first, regarding Cuba, this is our new newsletter. It just came out. Thank you, Crystal Rollins Jackson, for designing it and for helping us get all the details together. But it has a bunch of stuff. Uh, we don't have any services on uh, December 25th or January 1st for obvious reasons. You know, we want you to be with your family except we do have one on December 18th because we want the Holy Land Foundation to be with their families, the sooner the better. Um, and in January, there's a whole bunch of great stuff. We have a program on Howard Zinn. We'll play some, uh, some uh, recently digitized versions of uh, talks that Howard gave at Community Church. 
We have a program on Martin Luther King on that weekend from Letta, Letta Neely. Um, and um, a poetry, uh, poetry address by Jim Iflin, professor of Latin American literature at Boston University, talking about the Salvadoran poet Roque Dalton. And we have Richard Wolf. It's, it's, it's a marvelous set of stuff. But what I wanted to tell you about um, was two things. The first one about Cuba, we're screening a, a film uh, on January 21st, 7 p.m. And it's called Los Hermanos. And this is a beautiful film. It's about two world-class virtuosi musicians, Cubans. One of them lives in New York. His name is Ilmar Gavilan. And his brother lives in Havana. And his name is um, um, Omar Gavilan. No, what's, what's, his, what's his first name? Oh, boy. Um, I'm I'm, forget, I'm I'm blanking out on his first name, but these are are just remarkable top flight musicians. Ilmar came to the states um, because there was not enough learning for him there, and immediately attended Juilliard. and um, And these these this is a documentary about them and about the the the, the difficulty that they have because. They can't play together, and this is uh, like a um, it, it's their their first tour together in the United States during one of the administrations where it was possible for the tour to happen, and then another administration came in and it was impossible, and now there's another administration, and that administration is dragging its feet on on normalizing and thawing things out again. So it's 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 a really beautiful uh, film with. Uh, absolutely remarkable music. Uh, um, the Gavilan brothers, uh, the piano and violin. Um, so that's January 21st. I want to tell you about one more event, which is uh, on, it's a solstice celebration, December 22nd. It's actually the day after the real solstice and it's Thursday. And it's Dean Stevens and Magpie doing a, a holiday program together. And the title of the program is Holiday Songs You'll Never Hear at the Mall. I hope you'll join us. It's mostly a, a, um, a virtual uh, holiday event, but uh, we'll, I will be here at the church. And if folks want to come by and enjoy a little holiday cheer and see some of the, uh, the decorations that Luis has put up, beautiful uh, Guatemalan red and green uh, fabric and a Christmas tree and blinking lights and and some some barnyard animals under the tree so it's it's a, it's a beautiful thing um, finally before we go to q and I don't know if you can see this I will hypnotize you into giving community church a lot of money with this beautiful basket from Uganda that already has one, one check in it. Um, we have uh, enormous expenses around our building upkeep and maintenance projects coming up. We're working on a new kitchen, which we're going to call the Luis Guzman Honorary Kitchen. And Lee Underwood, who's here with us today, has worked very hard on that project, and we're looking forward to bringing it to fruition. We also have the extra expenses involved in putting on this program next week, which is our Sacco Vanzetti Award um, to uh, survivors of USA's war on terror, Sami Alarian and the Holy Land Foundation Five. And we have, um, we have, uh, we're flying in and putting up uh, three different guests. Uh, so um, you can send a check to us here in Copley Square, you, you know the address, or you can also visit our website where there's a PayPal option as well as a credit card option. Kella, here's my first question for you. How's school? What classes are you taking? Is it, is it a stimulating, um, amazing environment or is it uh, oppressive in any way? Are you gonna stick out the entire four years? 
I think the world needs you before that to, to uh, whip us up into uh, an activist frenzy. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely still figuring out whether I'll be able to stick around for the full four years. Um, I love my classes. They're really interesting. Um, I'm studying history and minoring in French. And since it's my first semester, I'm getting to, you know, take a lot of different classes. Um, one of my professors is very involved in Palestine activism on campus, which is really cool. And I've never gotten that kind of perspective from a professor before. Um, I'd say that a lot of what I talked about in my speech about these goals of individual success within the capitalist system um, are very present in the university environment, of course. Um, a lot of students are just concerned about packaging themselves into a career path, into a path and trajectory into the ruling class, um, rather than you know, trying to change the world or to think about themselves in relationship to the broader world outside of their own um, goals for achievement. Um, but the campus is also a site of resistance. Um, my university, McGill, was the last in Canada to divest from South African apartheid, and there is an ongoing struggle for it to divest from Israeli apartheid and colonization of Palestine. Um, which I have joined um, just in my first months here. And there's been a lot of suppression um, of the student organizing. The Palestine Solidarity Group passed um, a widely po popular solidarity policy through the student government that was supported by over 70% of the student population. And the student government refused to implement the policy and banned the Palestine group for six months. Um, so there's a lot of suppression mostly because the biggest donors to the university um, are pressuring them to, to, to oppose this Palestine activism and to suppress it. Um, so I'm involved in the struggle there, but it's definitely hard to balance, um, you know, being a regular university student with all the work that I do out of school, outside of school. Um, but like Asada said, you know, our education, these ruling class colonial institutions are not going to give us the information we need to free ourselves. So as much as I can be learning from my classes, I'm also, you know, trying to stay committed to political education outside of my, you know, readings that my professors assign me and to be learning constantly from the struggle. Yes. All right. So we have um, a question or two online, do we not, Amar? And is it is it in the chat or is it somebody who would like to join us? Oh, they're already. Go ahead. Claire, go ahead. Claire. Uh, yeah, Mike, I, I thank Kayla for the excellent, very informative presentation. I also went to Cuba this year, but not as for as long or as a part of a youth group, obviously. So there's some of the things that Kayla shared that. I totally saw myself. So thank you so much, Kayla. I'm gonna share that link of YouTube. The main reason I have my hand up is I wanna let people know that the Boston area standout next weekend on the 18th is from two to 3 p.m. It will not conflict with your event. And um, it's different than, it's usually gonna be the last Sunday of every month, but because the last Sunday this time is Christmas, we're going to do it on the Sunday before, but it's from 2 to 3 p.m. So that would be great. And it's going to be in Brookline at Coolidge Corner. We'll probably meet in front of the Brookline Booksmith. So thank you very much for all you're doing. And I'm going to let somebody else have a turn. You can go straight from Copley Square up to a standout in Coolidge Corner. The Green Line will take you. Um, another question from Tilly Ruth. Hey, Tilly Hi. Ruth. Um, all right. uh, I want to say uh, I enjoyed your talk. I'm not new to Cuba. I've had many, I've had long trips there, et cetera. But what I am concerned is, and this is friendly critique, that you did not really talk about your experience with your fellow brigadista. Now, you have to understand, almost 50 years ago, my daughter went to Cuba oh. uh, at the end of her. Uh, 
she missed her high school graduation. And so we did, did the brigade. And then after the brigade piece, um, uh, because she couldn't return to the U.S. right away, hitched around Cuba for a month or so. But uh, it's the experience, you know, how do you talk to my uh, grandkids, you know, and they're the ones that uh, really want to get involved with, you know, and, you know, so what can you, uh, can you add to some of your things that I can say, hey, listen to that record and hear what Kala has to say about the brigade. Yeah, so wait, so is your question about my experience with the other members of the brigade? Um, yeah, well, I had an amazing experience with everyone who was there, people from wildly different backgrounds, different parts of the US and the world. Um, but we built a really strong community. It felt like a family and I believe that many of those people will be lifelong friends um, to me. So I was definitely, you know, intimidated being the youngest person um, to be going on this trip with a ton of people older than me. But I felt like that didn't make a difference in how anyone judged or perceived me. And many of the people who were there had been going on brigades when they were teenagers or students themselves. Um, I was encouraged to go on the brigade in the first place by Mary Sara, who went on the first Vensoremos Brigade in 1969. And I'm so glad that I could, you know, carry on the, the movement because I think we're really passing on the baton to a new generation of leaders in the US Cuba solidarity movement. Also to leave with what you mentioned about your, your daughter missing her high school graduation. I didn't miss my graduation, but I did miss like my last week of classes and it was totally, totally worth it. Um, we are really, um, trying to make a national effort to be able to get more working class U.S. youth traveling to Cuba through NNOC. Um, when I decided to go on the brigade, I wasn't sure how I was going to pay for it. So we started doing some fundraising in July 26 in Boston that turned into a national effort to provide scholarships. And this time around for the 2023 brigade, um, NNOC nationally is coordinating fundraising and we're trying to raise tens of thousands of dollars um, to get working class youth, U.S. youth to Cuba to be learning from the revolution. So if people are looking for a way to support, um, definitely helping us with the fundraising and the outreach is something um, you can do and also encouraging young people in your lives to travel to Cuba. Um, and I'm always happy to be a person who can talk about my experience in Cuba to other young people, especially if they you know, are intimidated or um, not sure what the experience is like as a teenager or a student. So I hope that answers part of your question. All right. Thank you, Tilly Ruth and, and Kala. Uh, and there is another question online. Who? Rue Digger. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, very inspiring talk. Thank oh, you Rudiger. so much. <laughs> yeah, where do you go? Where do you go? Ooh, 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 <laughs> um, so uh, I brought here my son. He's 16. And um, so I have a uh, question which might be interested in him, also for him, but he can express his own question. But uh, you mentioned 15 years. That was the youngest which you mentioned. But I, I would like to know. Uh, how you were made, <laughs> basically, how you were educated to become so early a political activist. But um, uh, we can put this question in a back burner um, uh, and let my son uh, have a question as well. Um, he's 16. Yeah. Well, that was actually my question. My question was how, mm. if you uh, self-educated yourself to uh, these problems in Cuba, and um, just recently, like a month ago, we were learning about Puerto Rico and the uh, insular cases, uh, the Jones Act and um, the Treaty of Paris. And I feel lucky that my school is actually teaching this, but I was wondering if your school did the same. Yeah, thank you for the questions and thank you so much um, for listening in. I never really learned at Cuba at all um, during my education. I went to public and private schools um, for elementary, middle, and high school. 
different schools. And I don't remember ever learning about Cuba until my senior year. Um, I took a Latin American film class and my teacher was very, very honest about um, the Cuban revolution and about the US neocolonialism in Cuba that the revolution overthrew. He was definitely anti-communist still and critical of the current Cuban government, which I had some debates with him about. But um, the fact that he actually taught us an accurate history of US neocolonialism and interventionism and anti-communist genocides in Latin America was life-changing, I think, for a lot of students, or at least completely, um, you know, shifted their perspective. I remember people raising their hands and being like, wait, isn't that illegal for the U.S. to, you know, stage coups in all these countries? So it actually made people realize the lawlessness of U.S. empire and some of the lies that we are told. Um, in terms of how I educated myself, I took that class right around when I was starting to get radicalized myself. So I was doing like a lot of reading outside of school on my own. Um, I started, you know, learning directly from revolutionaries. I found that reading like memoirs and um, those sort of books like autobiographies were often more accessible to learn about some of the history and the ideas than just like a dense history or theory book. Um, although those are also great sources of information too as well. Um, I'd recommend learning directly from Cuban revolutionaries. Che is a beautiful writer. Um, and there's also many women Cuban revolutionaries who wrote about their experience. Um, I think what's hard is finding accurate current information about Cuba because the blockade and language barriers limit so much um, from getting into our sphere in the US. One of the best sources out there is called Belly of the Beast. Um, I know some of the people behind this production um, and it's a really amazing resource. They're, they're great people and they're Cubans and people from the US working together to, um, to defy the blockade and to get accurate information um, out there about um, Cuba and about the impacts of the blockade. So it's called Belly of the Beast. They have um, a lot of content on YouTube and on their social medias. They constantly are interviewing people. I was interviewed by them both times. I was in Cuba along with a lot of other people from the US. And um, they have great coverage of some stuff that's recently happened in Cuba, um, like the increased sanctions from Trump, Biden's refusal to lift them. Um, they covered the July 11th protests in 2021, which um, people probably heard a lot about, and they have much more accurate reporting on that than anything you'll see in like the mainstream imperialist media. Um, and what's great about Belly of the Beast is their videos are very short and accessible. Um, and like structured um, in an easy way. So I totally recommend watching those and um, sharing them with friends, hosting a screening. Um, hopefully we'll have something like that in Boston soon. Um, but yeah, in terms of the broader question of how I was educated, um, when I was politically active when I was younger, I wasn't really actively like doing political education. I wasn't like reading um, theory or reading history that much. I was just doing the work and that's why I think I was making, you know, mistakes and um, and doing work that was actually like harmful and um, reformist in many ways. So when I started to actually step back and um, educate myself um, was when my views started to change. And I realized that political education is an essential component of um, of the political work. And of course, they go hand in hand, because when you're putting these ideas into practice, you're seeing what works and what doesn't. And you are learning and educating yourself through your actions. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really important to be finding accurate information out there about Cuba, um, and especially perspectives directly from Cuba. Can I add that Felipe, it's really good to see you. And, um, I'd like to add another resource to what Calla just mentioned, Belly of the Beast, which I'm not familiar with, and I've write, written a note to myself right here on my hand. I hope I don't wash it off uh, before I for, remember to, to look them up. But um, Howard Zinn is a historian that spoke many times at Community Church, and we're having an event on January 3rd um, featuring uh, some excerpts uh, of many of the talks that he gave at Community Church over the course of uh, 35, 40 years. Um, and January 3rd, his son, Jeff Zinn, will be here with us physically. He and his wife are coming up from the Cape where they live and will be here physically at Community Church. So join us for that 
um, marvelous event, remembering just a, a marvelous um, historian who, who spoke the truth and didn't follow the narrative. What, what I saw one uh, cartoonist call the critical white master race theory <laughs> that, um, that dominates. And you can find uh, online um, the, the Zin Education Project which uh, is, is a resource, especially for teachers. Um, and it gives um, study guides and lesson plans on, on just a whole different alternative to what most um, history that is taught gives you. So those are two big, big places to, to look if you're, if you're hungry to learn, like I am still I'm a student. We're students forever. Um, let's see, uh, Ed, uh, yes, yes, January 8th, oh, yeah, 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 it's January 8th, I didn't have my glasses on, um, have we any more questions on, on this, oh, Charlie, Charlie, join us. I'd also add Helen Yaffe as a great current source. Um, Helen Yaffe? Helen Yaffe. She is a Scottish researcher and scholar on Cuba, and she's written a lot about Che and the special per period and the political economy of Cuba. How do you spell her last name? Y-A-F-F-E. Yaffe. Okay. <laughs> Charlie, are you there? Yeah, uh, we were about ready to talk and you uh, said something. Um, hi, Carla, it's Karen and Charlie from July 26th Coalition. It's great to hear you speak and 100% on your side. Um, I just wanted to add to uh, Tilly and to uh, Rudiger. My son turned 18 in Cuba in July, celebrating the July 26th. And that year was 1997 before Carla was born. And it was life changing for him. Um, he stayed in a doctor's octagonal house with two teenage sons. And the question that the boys had for my son, who was from the United States, was how could you let your abuelas die in the heat? And what were they referring to was in Chicago, two years earlier, there was a massive death. Hundreds of elderly died in their houses because they didn't have air conditioning and no one from the government could help them out and no one checked up on them. So these young fellows who were teenagers had no concept of how could you let your grandmothers die? So, I mean, if you think about that as an adult, as a parent, it's, it's life changing. So what happened to this 17 year old? He's now running for president of ATU 241 in Chicago, the second largest transit union, part of CIO, et cetera, with um, a, a, a union bureaucracy that is in the back pocket of, of uh, management. What's new here in the United States? We're way far from the 1930s and 40s in terms of unions with power, but we're trying to get there with the railroad workers, with the UC teachers, with Starbucks, with all the others that I'm not even mentioning. Um, and I'm looking forward to more of that happening here in the United States. And thank you so much for your work and your honesty. Thank you. That's amazing about your son. Congratulations to him for running for that position. Um, and that anecdote reminds me of something I heard this time around when I was in Cuba too. Um, we participated in workshops during the youth meeting. I was in the Peace and Solidarity workshop, which was led by Gerardo, who is one of the Cuban Five, like I mentioned, one of the freed political prisoners. He's the national leader of the Committees in Defense of the Revolution. And he and the rest of the Cuban Five were arrested when they were um, intelligence agents infiltrating um, exile terrorist groups in Miami. And he talked about um, how different um, and how more alienating society was during his time living in the United States. He said he only talked to one other person in his building. Um, a man from Argentina, and mm -hmm. they didn't realize that their elderly neighbor had died until they could smell the stench coming out from her apartment. So 
Um, and Cubit's so different, he explained, you know, if everyone in the community knows each other, cares for each other, if one elderly person, you know, misses their regular grocery trip, everyone would notice and everyone would come and check on them and care for them. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to share that since it really moved me. Um, and the committees in defense of the revolution um, are one of those key institutions that um, really ensures like everyone in the community is being accounted for and protected by. Wow. This has been a really rich and wonderful session at Community Church. Uh, thank you for being in our virtual meeting and here in attendance physically as well. Um, again, next Sunday is our Sacco and Manzetti Award. And, and the 22nd is uh, holiday songs you won't hear at the mall. Um, look into uh, joining us virtually for both of the, those events, as well as our entire newsletter. If you don't receive it um, in the mail, you can if you want, or you can go to our website and find it there as well, or sign up to our mailing list. Uh, and we will get that information to you. So thanks again, Kala and, uh, and Emma's Revolution. We're sorry you had to leave us a little bit early, uh, but we certainly understand. Uh, thank we'll you, thank you. Soon. Uh, is there somebody? Oh, no, it was just a um, an, an unmute that somebody did. Um, so- Hello, hello, hello. Someone wants to? Hello? Who is Hello? it? Lee. Hi. I, I'm, I'm so technologically, uh, whatever you want to call it, incompetent completely. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, very, very much. I visited Cuba uh, at the time that the kid was coming home. And th that's, a, I think, I can't figure out if it's 19 or 20 years ago, whatever it was. It was a wonderful, wonderful visit. I could never have expressed myself or, or any explained anything the way you did. I would like to know if 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 you made a video, is there um, do, is is I, I know there's a recording. Is there a recording that has Kali on it? I mean, physically. Um. Yeah, I believe that it is on the community. Please, could I have a copy? You, yeah. you just need to look it up. And I'll send you the link, Lee. And, and it's all right there, what we have just done. You okay. Can do it over and over. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I want. I want to be able to share it with my friends and, and, and all these things that I, that I saw and felt and could never express. It was, I had a wonderful, wonderful 10 days. It wasn't with a group. It was with, with a French friend. Uh, we got the legal permission because I was stuck. I, I, I teach a little Spanish as well as be, I was a French teacher. I'm totally retired now, but I would love to share. I would love to have, so I'll have a chance to listen to that and see you. Lee, I will make sure that you have the YouTube link. And Thank share, you. Uh, Thank you so with, much. With everyone on the planet. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're very welcome. Um, just to make sure... Before we conclude, is there anyone else who would like to chime in? Okay, well, we will we will end this program by thanking Emma's Revolution and Calla Walsh. Calla, we hope to be seeing you when you come home for the holidays uh, <laughs> here here at the church. And um, good luck with your finals. Mm -hmm. I remember that feeling well. And. I will finish with another verse from Jose Marti of the song Guantanamera. With the poor of the earth, I want to cast my fate. The river of the mountain gives me more pleasure than the ocean. Con los pobres de la tierra, quiero yo mi suerte echar. Con los pobres de la tierra quiero yo mi suerte echar. El arroyo de la sierra me complace más que el mar. Guantanamera. Thank you, Cala Washcoquira. Guantanamera. Thank you, everybody. Guantanamera. Guajira. Guantanamera.
we're going to proceed to have a lunch that Luis Guzman has prepared for us here at uh, Community Church of Boston. And we say over and out, meeting is over. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.